How bad are things in Edinburgh? Uh, what I would say, firstly, is is I wouldn't really call it a, a pay hike. I think the, the workers concerned are really just looking for a fair pay rise and nothing more. And these are key workers who worked right the way through COVID in Edinburgh. Uh, and I don't think a, a domestic bin was missed really throughout that time, which is a fantastic effort. And we have to remember that during the pandemic, they were dealing with quite unknown risks around the transmission of the disease. So they really do deserve our, our respect and, and a fair pay rise. In terms of the impact, you know, I live in suburban Edinburgh and, and I think people uh, are dealing with it quite well. Uh, and in many respects, you know, it, life goes on as normal. But in the city centre, as your pictures on the screen there have shown, it, it's, it's a different kettle of fish, if I can use that phrase. The, uh, and it's, it's quite shameful. I feel quite ashamed, actually, seeing it. Uh, particularly when this is the time of year when Edinburgh is open to the whole world as we run our festivals. Where has Nicola Sturgeon been? Uh, why is she uh, Why is she being having these accusations of being asleep at the wheel, absent from the day job, levelled at her? Well, I, I mean, I, I don't want to personalise this, but, you, you know, the, the the Scottish government, I guess, has its own priorities. And I think Nicola Sturgeon has been in Copenhagen this week where the the Danish Prime Minister, I think, declined an offer to meet her. Uh, but I do know that trade unions in Scotland would be very happy to meet her uh, to talk of, talk about this crisis. And it is a crisis for everyone right now. What was, she, what was she dissolved. doing? What was what was she doing in Copenhagen, though? What was uh, what was on her uh, official schedule there? So I think she was opening, you know, uh, what some people in Scotland might call part of our pretend embassy network. You know, uh, an office to help support uh, her agenda. I guess you would say overseas, but you know, also support businesses. But the, the one in Copenhagen is a little bit of an anomaly because it's actually inside the the British embassy. I think. Uh, and that's not something that people talk about too much within the Scottish government for some reason. It, it's it's no she's no she's no stranger to accusations though of of vanity projects uh, taking up more of her time uh, when reasonably we might say she should be focusing on the day job. You know when when Scotland is uh, you know has uh, challenges for its health services record drug deaths, the debacle over the ferries, uh, all sorts of infrastructure problems. Uh, you know, what is she doing uh, attending book festivals to talk about herself and, and opening pretendy embassies in Copenhagen, you know, when the, when the rubbish is piling high and the infrastructure is cracking? Well, I mean, uh, Scotland faces huge challenges just now and it can be difficult to keep up with what the Scottish government's number one priority is. I mean, it goes from education to solving the drugs dex crisis to uh, the, the, the climate emergency. Uh, but the, the issue is that solving these problems re requires difficult conversations and it requires difficult decisions to be made. And the nature of the government in Scotland, you know, the SNP Green government we have, is that they, they don't want to upset anyone because we're, we're governed by focus group and, and the focus of those focus groups it is all about that Scottish independence referendum. And I think, Neil, but Neil, you know as well as I do, uh, Scotland's never going to be vote, vote to be poorer. So I just find this whole situation quite frustrating. I would much rather we were talking about education, climate, climate emergency, uh, the drug deaths, and also the chronic underfunding of local government we've faced in Scotland for, for some time. Uh, it's a useful distraction, I think, talking about independence. And my observation I would make is whenever things are not going the Scottish Government's way, they start talking about independence more as a distraction. And I think we're all guilty of, of falling for that trap at times. My, one of my, uh, if you bear with me, one of my guests in the, in the studio, uh, uh, Kerry, is uh, keen to ask you a question herself. I'll let that go ahead. I just wondered if you could tell us what the demands of the bin men are. I, I've read that the Scottish public, probably like many of us, uh, down south are really on the side of um, the rubbish collectors who are on, uh, in, it's my understanding, on average 20 grand a year, which is, you know, it's called poverty, basically. But I wonder if you could tell us what their demands are. I understood that 
the council, Edinburgh Council, or was it Glasgow, had put forward 3% and then were arguing for the government to match that, which would make 6%. But 6% on 20 grand still sounds like penury to me. I take home 24 grand and it's awful. So I'm just wondering what they're actually demanding. So, I, I mean, you would have to ask really the trade unions uh, what they're demanding, but, but you, you're right. Uh, in Edinburgh, we set aside 3% and what we're saying to the Scottish Government is we want you to at least match that. Uh, this week, the, the trade unions rejected a 5% offer, which was uh, the equivalent, I think, of around £1,450 uh, £1, uh, per member of staff. Whereas in England, I think the, the offer made to staff in England is just under two thousand nineteen hundred and twenty-five pounds. I think it was. Uh, so here we have our progressive government in Scotland, as it calls itself, offering a pay rise to workers here far less than the the, the Conservative government uh, in England, which in I England. find uh, quite an incredible situation. Uh, I think discussions, though, I mean, obviously the trade unions, are, trade unions will make their own demands, their own reasonable demands. But I think uh, a 6% pay rise, which is more weighted towards the lower paid workers, uh, I, I think is something they would they would actively consider. I'm not, I don't want to speak on their behalf, though. Uh, just uh, w one last question for you there. I, I, I believe Nicola Sturgeon is a, is a huge fan of GB News and of Neil Oliver Live in particular. So I have very little doubt but that she's sitting in her Paddington Bear pyjamas watching this. Uh, given that, uh, what advice would you have for the First Minister uh, in, in coming to terms with what's required from your point of view uh, for the good people of Edinburgh? So you, you broke up a little bit there. I mean, I don't want to personalise this, uh, but what I would say is that local government in Scotland is both has been underfunded and undermined for, for some time. Edinburgh, Scotland's capital, is one of the worst funded councils in the whole of Scotland. Uh, so in the short term, I, I hope the Scottish Government will enter constructively into negotiations. Alongside the SNP Ryan Cosler, which is a group that represents Scottish, Scottish councils in these negotiations, uh, a lot of people have been quite critical of their willingness to really take on the Scottish Government on this issue. But I hope around these pay, around these pay, around this, around this pay dispute, uh, the Scottish Government is able to enter into constructive negotiations. But once we get past this, you know, the, the Scottish budget coming forward, uh, Edinburgh faces a further £60 million cut. And as a councillor, we are, we are having crisis meetings to look at how we deal with that cut to local services and the impact that might have, you know, on education, on, on waste, which we're talking about just now, but also health and social care. Some of the most vulnerable people in Edinburgh uh, might be facing the impact of these cuts. So really, we need, need to set aside our differences and, and constructively work together to address the issues that local government faces.